Hello and welcome. I know that I've been a little light on the content recently. There is real content coming. I've just been super busy. I know I say that a lot. In a few weeks, it's coming for real. Um, but I just wanted to share with you one thing that I have been working on, and that is a guest lecture, which I'll be delivering next week. What I'm going through now is a mature draft stage of, of that lecture. And let's get into it. So at my university, at one of the courses that I tutor, one thing which the lecturer does every year as a tradition is they make a game. And they ask the students, what game would you like to make? And this year, the students all voted for Fortnite. Wow. Now, of course, we can't really do Fortnite, especially not with TK Inter, graphical user interface library. That's too much. But the call was put out there, can anyone make a 3D game? And I said, yeah, I can totally make a 3D game. And so that's what I'm presenting now. Anyway, from lines to worlds. I mean, it really is cool how all you need is lines and you can tell stories. You can make 3D worlds. It's, it's so cool. I want to talk about Greek myths. My favorite Greek myth is Prometheus. That's why I became a teacher is I wanted to bring down the fire of knowledge so that people could like do really cool stuff. And anyway, on and on and on. So to start off, little bit about myself. Hello, I'm Andrew. I, this is for the university students, of course, go through my university tutoring stuff. Um, as far as, oops, as far as what we've got here, um, I am an independent game developer, Blindspot Software. Very cool. I currently have about two projects, both stuck in development hell. Yeah, whoops. Uh, ooh, you know how it is. Um, but my big interest is ray tracing. So if we look down on the bottom right, we see this scene. And this is running at about 3000 frames per second. And no, you don't just grab all your data and throw it at the GPU. You learn how th the thing works. And a really magical thing happens where the GPU becomes a little more human and you become a little more machine-like. Anyway, um, and then... On the left here, we have a still from one of my recording sessions. Here we have me on the left, all pumped up with energy. And on the right, not so much. But yeah, I just want to reiterate to the students that, no, you know, I didn't make Fortnite. But anyway, the agenda, what are we going to go through today? Well, we're going to go through the background theory of 3D. We're going to go through 3D rendering. And... It's not just 3D rendering, because if we don't organize things properly, we can run into trouble really quickly. So we also need to talk about how we're going to organize our game environment so that the 3D rendering is a little easier. And we'll have some questions and or answers. If you're watching at home, put your questions down below. Um, but first of all, a warning. Programming involves math. I'm sorry, that's it. Now. You don't need to be an abstract mathematician. You, it doesn't need to be super technical. But you do need to understand linear algebra to the point where you have a gut feeling for it. That's the point at which this stuff really gets better. But turns out, for now, we are not using any linear algebra, not explicitly. You can formulate this stuff as linear algebra, but we're not doing that. This is the... the base code for this is something which I produced after my first introductory programming course. I sat down, I was like, I want to make a project. So I made a project. I did it in one weekend. I bought a two liter bottle of Coke and it was just a wild time. Always look back fondly on those times. But anyway, so here we are. What are the rules of the game? So we have TK Enter. It's a simple graphical user interface library. It's for making buttons and stuff, making little little applications is definitely not for 3D, but it has canvas widgets and canvas widgets, we can draw lines on them, all right? So we're not doing any images. We're not doing anything fancy. All we're using is create line. In order to do that, we need two endpoints, a start and an end. And basically the hard part is calculating the points. Then we draw a line between them. And here we see down below, that's the function. X start, Y start, and so on. It's just that. Um, and it turns out we can do a lot of cool things 
with just shapes. I mean, if we look at this shape on the left, this uh, sort of looks like a Tool album cover, this is just an optical illusion. I mean, obviously this is 3D, if you, uh, 2D, I mean, sorry, it looks 3D. If you're a talented artist, you can go and draw one of these things and give people the illusion that they're in 3D. I've seen shirts with these sorts of patterns printed on them. Looks like people have holes in their chest, that's crazy. But it doesn't even have to be that intense. We look on the right, this is just simple lines and it looks 3D. Why is that? Why does that thing that we think of as the back face, what makes that the back face? Isn't that sort of trippy? Isn't that sort of like a powerful thing? Now have a look at this. This is, I believe, the simplest, rawest form of a 3D optical illusion. On the left, we have a line. Is that a line or is it a horizon? Isn't it weird how we look at that and we can sort of imagine it as a horizon? I mean, if you were trying to make a 3D game, and if you want to talk about diminishing returns, you get so many initial returns just from setting up that horizon line. I could talk about it forever. But then on the right, we have a rectangle. And in the center of the rectangle, we have an origin point. We'll call that a crosshair. It's like an origin point. And if we imagine traveling from the corners towards that origin point, getting smaller and smaller, things which are smaller away from us but further away from us appear smaller. And that's the, the real meat of this optical illusion that we're going to be creating. I also want to talk about basically what we're doing. So I'm going to run through an example. Here we have sort of on the left image, we have our world, our, our model of our game system. We have a player and they're in a box. Then on the right, we have this screen system, this coordinate system. And this is the view class. This is from the player's point of view. Okay. And probably at this point, I should just quickly flick over to the prototype and give this a run. I'll be flicking back to this a number of times. So I'll give this a shot and bring this over. And what we can see here is a 3D world. We got some, some Drake Nanas. Students in this course, they love Drake in a banana suit. It's like a common meme. So I made a bunch of those. But look, this is the basic idea. We walk around. This is our 3D world. We've got a whole bunch of Drake Nanas. Too many. Good thing they're not shooting at me. But yeah, look, it's a, it's a 3D world. Isn't that so cool? So all we're doing here is using lines. And it's this optical illusion that I'm really investigating or really the math behind drawing those lines. So back to it, we have our world, and then that information is used to construct a view, which we can see on the right. So the thing that I love about this is it's so, the core of it is quite simple. So the, the first idea basically is that the player is at the center of the world. I know a few people who could really uh, resonate with this idea. So on the left image here, we have a world. We have this sort of room and we see the player there. We see their positions. We see the coordinates of all the endpoints of all the lines. And then the image on the right, what I've done is subtracted the player's X coordinate and Y coordinate from all of those points. By the way, the convention I'm working with is that sort of negative Y is the top of the screen, positive Y is the bottom of the screen, but there's no reason to, to go this way. We could flip things around. That's totally fine. But yeah, this is the core idea. Subtract the player position from all points in the world. This sets it up so that the player is the origin of the world. So the way we do this is with this translate function. So I'll just pop back to the code and investigate it. Again, we see right down here in the... Oh. oh, yeah. In the helper functions, we have translate. And this just takes in a tuple with two floats. We extract the information from the tuple and the translation and just add those together and return that as a new float. That's translating. And where that's used is down below in this world to view transform. This is essentially just taking some points and well, the first thing we're doing 
is subtracting the player's position. So on with the show. Now, the next step basically is that the player doesn't spin. Imagine, do this right now, spin your head around, okay? If I spin my head to the left, I know that I'm spinning to the left, but if I act really self-centered for a second and pretend that I'm not spinning, it's as if the world is spinning around me. It's like the world spinning to my right, the world spinning opposite to me. So if I look at this, on the left-hand side, we have the player and we see that they have some angle around the x-axis. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the points for those the endpoints of those walls and rotate them in the opposite direction to where the player's direction is. Now, this diagram isn't 100% accurate. If it was a square, it would be accurate. I'm pretending it's a square. Whoops. But, I mean, that's it. We just spin that around. So, this is accomplished with a rotate point function, which we can see if we go right up here, rotate point. Now what I'm doing here, under the hood, this is actually linear algebra. This is the, applying a matrix for a rotation transformation. But, I mean, don't be scared, just look into math, I guess. It comes back so much. But yeah, okay, so it, we rotate around that point, we return that, and that is being applied down below in this world to view transform. So the first thing we did was subtract the player's position. Secondly, I'm actually rotating 90 degrees and then opposite the player, just because I sort of like that system better. But the big thing to really pay attention to is that the, the rotation angle is the opposite of whatever the camera's direction is. So we can actually see this in action if we run this again. Here, if you just ignore the Drake Niners for a second, we see that on the left-hand panel, we have our top-down view of our world. Okay, so as we move, see the red dot, the player, is always the center of the world. And then, as we spin, if we spin to the left, nothing happens, but the world around us spins to our right, and likewise the other way. Now, the... I guess the, yeah, the next most important thing to notice is now if I look at my left panel, if I look at my left panel, the X coordinate to the left or the right actually more or less lines up with the X coordinate of the wall's endpoint on the screen. So if I were to go here, for instance, I have some point coming off here to the left, and then about center is this wall here, and then this other point is coming off to the right. Okay, so that's super important. And then the next thing is that the Y coordinate, the vertical distance above the player, represents the distance that each point is away from the player. So we'll be using that in a second. Okay, so. Now here's the big one. This is the magic. Um, objects further from the viewer get smaller. So if we were to look back at our, our little theoretical view, we have our player in the left panel and see that there's a bunch of walls, but not all of it is actually visible. Only, I guess, potentially the walls A, B, and C are visible. Walls A and C are partially clipped because part of them are behind the player. And that other wall is just completely clipped because both endpoints are behind the player. And now if we look at the middle panel, really we're just going to see the walls A and B. Now for the wall A, it has two endpoints, one at the leftmost side of the screen and it extends to the center of the screen and B goes from the center to the rightmost. Now for those walls, it just so turns out that A, A's rightmost line segment lines up with B's leftmost line segment. So we will actually be drawing that line segment twice, but it will look the same because it's at the same position. So then we can also see the distance that each of these line segments is from the player. And then on the rightmost segment, 
uh, on the rightmost image, that is, the wall A is really close to us and it goes to the far point and then B comes back. So you can see all we're really doing is dividing the size, the height of the walls by their distance. Now, actually, we would also be dividing the X distance from the origin, which has sort of a squashing effect as things get further from us. But yeah, that's it. So this is accomplished with two main functions. First of all, we're going to clip a line. I'll show this briefly, but it's not super necessary to understand. Um, and then we have the scale function. So if we pop back, we have here clipping a line. Now this is basically using Kramer's rule to solve for the intersection of two line segments. I won't go super into detail on this because it's a very intimidating formula, but if you look up on Wikipedia, intersection of two line segments, this is the general formula for it. And then we also have scale and scale is very straightforward. All we do is multiply the points. So where this is all happening is down below in the view to screen transform. Whoops, there we go. Okay, so remember I was saying that one coordinate is how far to the left or right we are. The other coordinate is how far we are from the player. So we extract all that information. Now, if both points are behind the player, we can just return straight away. If one point is behind the player, then we'll go ahead and clip the line. And depending on which line gets clipped, we'll be adjusting one of these points. But there we go. And now the big concept is right down here, where we take the x coordinate, divide it by the depth, and then we'll generate the top and bottom of the wall based on the wall's height and, and so on. But we divide them by the depth as well. So the big concept is that points which are further away from the player, everything's divided by the depth, points which are further away will get smaller. So I'll just run this again. I know I keep, I know I keep running this, but I think it is a good sort of example. So as we can see here, this line segment, its corner is further away from the player, and so it gets smaller. Yeah, there we have it. Very cool, very cool. Now, I will point out there are more mathematically sophisticated ways to do this. That's a great thing to look into when you have the time, but I really love this prototype because it's something you can whip up super quickly, explain super quickly, and reason about. There's just something cool about it. I don't know. Anyway, so the next big concept is we've got our world, but we need to organize it somehow because... I mean, look at that scene that I was playing. We have a whole bunch of walls and things, and clearly we don't want to be checking our collisions against each of the walls every frame. And it gets even worse if we have objects or players, other enemies and things walking around in the world. Like if I did collision checks on those Dregnanas and each thing was checking each other thing every single frame, that's too much. That's far too much. There's got, got to be a better way. And it comes down to essentially organizing our world in what's called a scene graph. So if we look here, we have sort of our, our model, like our scene, it measures, uh, sorry, it tracks all of the objects and their interactions. Okay. So the world is modeled and it is comprised of rooms and rooms are connected by doors and rooms themselves contain things. So rooms have sectors, which can have all heaps of other things. So anyway, this is a hierarchical structure and it organizes the space together. And then as well as that, sectors can be connected together. So if we were to look at this diagram on the left, we have a little room with six sectors. Now, each of these sectors will have a connection to another sector and the really big concept here, the big idea, is that every sector knows what it's connected to. And so if we were to look at the interface of these classes, we have here, um, let's start with the room. Okay, so for the room, it's very straightforward. We can just activate, deactivate it. Only active rooms get drawn and all of that. But the big one here is the sector. So think of a sector as a sort of black box. 
and it can spawn Drake Nanas, ha ha ha. But also we can test if a position is inside of a sector. We can tell the sector, hey, look at this position here. What what new sector are we in? And that could say, it could say you're in myself, or it could say you're in one of my neighbors. And we can also check whether um, if we're at a given position and we're a certain size, we're moving with a certain speed, do we hit a wall? So again, I'll just go back to the prototype and give this a shot. And I, I want you to really pay attention to the image on the left. So see, there's that red wall. This red wall is basically indicating which sector we're in at the moment. We can also see this down on the bottom in this info panel. So, and by the way, I don't know why the room isn't changing, but it should be changing. So here we're in a different sector and we can see also we're only checking against these three boundaries when we move around. So, you know, we stop here stop here. Collision checking is working correctly. So here we're in sector one. And when we cross over, this sector is connected to another sector. The door doesn't really have anything to do with it. The point of the door is just to delineate the different rooms so that we're not rendering everything all at once. Although I'm pretty sure my computer would handle it. But anyway, right. So here's another thing to consider though. This is a closed world. Whereas Fortnite is an open world. So if we were to make Fortnite, how do we handle that? One common approach, well, basically any sort of spatial subdivision system. So any, any system that kind of puts a, I guess, a grid on 3D space and you can work out like which, which region you're in and you can only, it's limited. So you only check collisions against things in that region. There are considerations there, however. Um, Doom famously had a two-dimensional grid system used for checking collisions, and sometimes objects would just not be in the right grid box and collision checks would miss. You'd shoot an enemy, the bullet would go right through them. So there are considerations. In my opinion, especially for Python, for Python, I'd probably do what I've done in other projects, which is set up a dictionary and the dictionary corresponds. Its keys are three integer tuples describing a box region in 3D space. So if you get your position divided by 50, for instance, that would give you an integer position. That's the box that you're in. And you can do that a whole bunch of times, be in different boxes and things. But um, yeah, I mean, that's that's some stuff. So, I mean, really, that's basically it. Again, got to let the students know. And by the way, this misspelling is on purpose. But anyway, um, that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Um, yeah. So, thank you for... Thank you for checking out my presentation. Um, I really do wish you the best if you're, a, if you're into this sort of stuff. I think it's so cool. And um, if I want to leave you with something, okay, if I want to leave you with something. One book that I read last year that I really enjoyed was Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon. It goes through all this stuff. It goes through Unix programming and cryptography and espionage and all these things, corporate espionage. And the one of the main characters, his name's Jack Shafto or Bobby Shafto. I forget. I forget. Anyway, he's a Marine and he's just found out that he has a son who he's, he's never seen before. But now he, uh, at a late point in the, in the book, I'm doing a poor job of describing this. He finds his son and they're in a temple in Manila. And he has this sort of pressing feeling at the edge of his consciousness that he may never see his son again. He might not survive the next mission. So he needs to get one message through to his son. So he picks up his son and he's walking up and down the steps of this Manila, Manila temple and he's impressing upon the son that this thing was made by people, this really big, impressive thing. Bring it back a little bit. Was made by people. And the only way that people make things that stand the test of time 
is just one step at a time, one layer at a time. The only way you make a complicated system is you make decisions. This I'm veering away from the book now. You make decisions, you make abstractions, and then you iterate on it one step at a time. And that's what I want to leave you with. Like you guys, if you're watching this, you probably have all the tools that you need right now to make cool stuff. So go, go do it. Anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed. And yeah, like I said, proper tutorials once I, I just finished a whole bunch of marking today. So really, truly proper tutorials are coming soon as well as other content. All right. Have a great one. I'll see you again soon. Bye.